delighted to welcome you um, to the first session of this year's interdisciplinary um, lecture series on the topic of neuroethics. Um, I, I welcome you on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Grossman Institute for Neurosciences, Quant Quantitative Biology, and Human Behavior. Um, the series uh, that's about to be launched uh, was organized by John Monsell, who is here in the front, the director of the Grossman Institute, by Peggy Mason, professor of neurobiology, um, and Dan Solmezi from the McLean Center, um, working with an interdisciplinary faculty committee representing more than 10 university departments, clinical departments like psychiatry, neurology, and neurosurgery, as well as non-clinical uh, departments, including the Committee on Social Thought, Philosophy Department, and the like. Um, recent advances in the neurosciences uh, have raised and continue to raise important ethical issues, uh, some of which are of such magnitude as to have given rise to this new field of neuroethics. Uh, our speaker today, uh, I'll introduce uh, Professor Illis in a moment, was one of the early pioneers in the field. Um, this year's McLean faculty series with the Grossman Institute will examine many of these issues uh, over a series of 22 lectures. Um, some of the topics, of course, uh, you can see if you pick up a, a brochure for this year's sessions. Um, but the lectures will draw upon the expertise of an international and interdisciplinary group of scholars representing the neurosciences, philosophy, psychology, history, law, and medicine. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Judy Illis. Professor Illis is a professor of neurology, the Canada Research Chair in Neuroethics, and the director of the National Core for Neuroethics at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Illis is a founder, a governing member, and the president-elect of the International Neuroethics Society. And I just want to tell you that the International Neuro Neuroethics Society will be holding its annual meeting uh, in Chicago on Thursday and Friday, October 15 and 16. Um, the Thursday session on October 15 is a public session, as I understand, mm -hmm. open to the public. And, and then there's a more formal session on Friday the 16th, which will be at the Art Institute. Did I? Yes. Um, and the, the program I, I've looked at is quite extraordinary. For registration, go online to the neuroethicssociety.org. Dr. Illis's research focuses on ethical, legal, social, and policy challenges, specifically at the intersection of the neurosciences and biomedical ethics. Uh, these include studies in the areas of neurodevelop neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, incidental findings on uh, imaging, um, clinical research, addiction neuroethics, stem cells and regenerative medicine, dementia, and on and on. Professor Illis's most recent books uh, are in 2015 on the use and over, overuse of antipsychotics in children, published by Elsevier, um, a book on contemporary ethical issues in behavioral neuroscience, published by Springer in 2015, and a book on the addiction neuroethics issues, published by, again by Elsevier in 2012. Today, Professor Illis will speak to us on the topic, Aligning Human Values and Neuroscience in the Age of Neurotechnology. Please join me in giving a warm University of Chicago welcome to Professor Judy Illis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with me at this inaugural lecture of the McLean's Neuroethics Series. And Dr. Siegler and Dr. Samancy, thank you for uh, honoring me to give this uh, first lecture of this series. And thank you to those of you of the program committee for 
bringing me here to Chicago. So I'd like to talk about neuroscience and human values and neurotechnology. Um, as an introduction to neuroethics to you today, I always begin by acknowledging my team in Vancouver, those who work with me, those who collaborate, those who advise us, and of course our participants and our funders. And you will meet some of my team members through this neuroethics journey in the next 50 minutes or so. So I want to begin with some first principles. Um, and I, perhaps the most important one in our pragmatic approach to neuroethics is that for the sciences of the central nervous system, so there's the brain and the spinal cord, to be applied well for the benefit of people and society, it's really critical to identify ethics challenges at the earliest stages. Now, I'll, I'll show you quite a, quite a bit of work that we've been doing in Canada and around the world, and you'll say, well, in some cases, she's ahead of the, ahead of the pack, and in some cases, the horse has already left the barn, and that's okay, because it's better, in, in a sense, uh, better, better late than never, um, and certainly, the earlier that we can be in addressing ethics challenges in the neuroscience, neurosciences that we're doing today, the better. Um, the other, perhaps, first principle, and it's really where I'm going to spend most of my time today, is how important it is that, to bring the voice of all stakeholders to our neuroethics story. We can do all kinds of different kinds of neuroethics. I'm going to bring to you studies today that have really brought the voice of stakeholders forward those of physicians like yourselves, patients, researchers, neuroscientists, philosophers, and so on. This is not to show off how busy we are at the University of British Columbia, but we are busy. And this is just a rubric of some of the studies we have going on under six major categories, and you see them here. The topics that I bold-faced uh, at the top of the slide are those that I'm going to touch on today. And I just also want to show you at the bottom of the slide the wide array of methodological approaches that we use in approaching the neuroethics problems that we, we uh, tackle on a daily basis in Vancouver, Canada. And if the sound tech could see if you could make the feedback go away a little bit, that would be helpful. I'm having a little bit of cognitive uh, challenge with uh, my, own, my own voice. Thank you. So this is a bit of a Duinian chart. I'm not a philosopher. I'm a neuroscientist by training. I grew up doing imaging. But I, I love this simple pathway. And it really defines what it is we seek to do. We seek to identify ethical issues around neuroscience discovery, maybe before they occur, maybe as they're going on, and maybe in response. But we try to be proactive rather than reactive. We take a very empirical approach to what we do, which is that we collect data, we reduce it, we interpret it. Uh, we deliberate over the data that we acquire, and then at the end of the day, we try to deliver solid guidance, evidence-based guidance, guidance that's solution-oriented in a way that achieves best practices and maximizes benefit for all the constituents with whom we work. And to this end, and I love this quote from Anne Glover, it came out a couple of years ago in Science, ultimately what we're doing is injecting science into policymaking. So we're really taking an internally driven approach to policy and health policy in particular, rather than an external approach um, to neuroscience, where sometimes we have to do a lot of iterative adjustment because when it comes from the outside in, it's not always as well matched as it is when we actually can push the understanding in an evidence-based way out to our policy makers. And so, I'm going to take this introduction and I'm going to ground it for you in three case examples that I'd like to share with, with you today of research from our group. And I'd also like to ground the research in the human values that I would most closely associate with these studies. So the first one will be stem cell trials and spinal cord injury. And I want to talk a little bit about autonomy with you as we think about that science. Then I'd like to talk with you about neuroimaging and disorders of consciousness and the impact on self. And finally, a little bit about neurogenetics and dementia. And again, these capture our goal today, neuroscience discovery, human values, and neurotechnology. And I've chosen them from among the others I could have chosen from that big chart that I showed you, because I think that they really do highlight some of the issues at the intersection of, of neuroscience technology, neurotechnology, and values. 
The timeliness and relevance, I think, to an audience like yours and to this amazing McLean Center for Medical Ethics. And as well, that they um, have each had a significant impact uh, where we've been able to take our results and push them out into the real world. And they also will have, um, and I'll show you, um, very specific future trajectories that we've linked onto the original studies. So just as a last way of introduction, this is our analytic approach. I'll be showing you mostly discourse data. So these are data from interviews and focus groups, for example, and I just want to emphasize that our approach to this kind of social science data is very rigorous. It's every bit as rigorous as when I used to do imaging experiments or run rats on a maid or uh, make single unit recordings from cells that went boop or boop. Um, it's just a different kind of science. And so you just see here with an analytic approach is taken from Staus and Coben, where we collect data and we start to reduce it into meaningful units until we can put it together both from individuals and across individuals and groups and we can provide rigorous explanatory accounts of the data that we acquire. It's an iterative process throughout the analysis, unlike some of us who do other kinds of hypothesis-driven research where you start and you don't start looking at your results until all the data have been collected. This kind of approach applies both to discourse data, that is narrative data, as well as to other kinds of content analysis that I'll show you a little bit of. For example, uh, analyses of peer-reviewed literature, uh, media reports, and other kinds of content analysis. So let's begin with our story about stem cell trials. And stem cells in particular, a huge focus for us in Canada and of course all around the world. Here are some basic statistics on spinal cord injury. We know that in the United States alone, there's new 20,000, 12,000 new cases of paraplegia and quadriplegia alone. 80% of the SCI patients are males. They're usually less than 30 years old, and they're almost, they're not almost, almost, but they're largely from traumas, car accidents, uh, sports injuries, and so forth. And as you well know, the tensions between the science and society and divide are enormous in this space. We've been seeing and hearing about the promise of stem cells since the 1960s for a wide array of applications. We've seen trials like the Geron trial that was started and halted, but we are still very much at the bench, as well as in clinical trials. And we were very interested in, in hearing and filling a gap of what are the stakeholders actually thinking about stem cells in the science-society divide at the bench and for clinical trials. And here are just two members of my team, Dr. Kwan and Marlene Eichholt, who've been working with me on this topic. So I'm going to share with you very superficially, on the surface, three phases of work in this area, rather than going deep, which I think the other speakers in this series are going to do. But it's nice for me to give you an overview across a sampler of neuroethics. So in 2008, one of the first things we did was we went to basic scientists, and we said, if you were to think about the ethics of stem cells, have you been thinking about it, and what would you think, what would you prioritize for us? And in a small group of 11 neuroscientists, mostly on the West Coast, we found these priorities, everything from ensuring that vulnerable people, particularly those such as traumatic, uh, traumatic spinal cord injuries, give proper informed consent. We have to foster public trust in all that we do. I was delighted to hear that they prioritized that we develop experts that are versed not only in the science or not only in the ethics, but that scientists, scholars who are versed across both, and that we develop rigorous criteria for uh, moving preclinical data and preclinical trials into clinical studies. Very important groundwork, very important insight for us. And we took this guidance and we moved it to the next level, now at UBC. And I want to ask this audience, what do you imagine to be the ideal time point for a clinical trial intervention for somebody like, for somebody with a spinal cord injury. Give me a time, I'm going to give you a time window. Do you think an, from an ethical point of view, is an intervention maximum at zero to three days? For those of you who think yes, please raise your hands. Seven days post-injury. Six weeks to three months post-injury. You're either very shy in Chicago or you're going to give me some data I'm not expecting. 12 months out and even, even further out, really late out. 
Okay, so you're not responding. Those of you in the back of the room, maybe you're eating some lunch. Thank you. Minus two days. We have to talk about that afterwards. I'm not sure how you do that. Well, so we ran a very large study of more than uh, 200 neuroscientists and clinical scientists. We asked the question, and the responses we got from them is that the ideal time window would, in fact, be six weeks to three months out post-injury. Important data, but when, in fact, you look to see when the clinical trials are being conducted uh, post-trauma, you find out that they're actually being conducted within a seven to 14-day time window. So ethically at odds with what our own experts are saying. So then we turned to people with spinal cord injuries themselves, and we conducted a large study, both with patients who were uh, uh, quite a, a long time post-injury, shown uh, on the left side of the slide, and those who were um, just subacute a few days out. And we asked them questions about their spinal cord injury, stem, their understanding of stem cells, and also their receptivity to uh, enrolling in clinical trials. And we found some both unsurprising and surprising data. Unsurprising was that the patients who were chronic post-injury, oh, that is not good, there we go, um, were somewhat well-versed in the science of stem cells compared to those who were just recently post-injury. But what I want to draw your attention to here is the lower two quadrant of this table. And it has to do with risk tolerance and change tolerance. And we hypothesized that the individuals with cervical injuries, chronic cervical injuries, would be the most prone to a stem cell intervention. We thought they had um, the most serious injury there, would, therefore they would be the least risk averse. And I want to tell you that we were dead wrong. Maybe I'll tell you we were dead wrong. All right, let's see what's going on. So my computer has frozen. That is a bad thing. All right, let's carry on. So what we found was, in fact, quite the opposite of what we hypothesized, that individuals with chronic, chronic cervical injury were the most risk averse to stem cell trials completely the opposite of what we predicted. We predicted they would be the most tolerant to risk. And in fact, we found it was those with thoracic injuries in the chronic stage. And here are just some quotes to illustrate, some selected quotes to illustrate these viewpoints. And what we learned, in fact, from these patients, at the end of the day, is that those with the most severe injuries felt they had the most to lose. And therefore, they were the most risk averse. And of course, we always recognize those in the middle. Um, who were a bit on the fence. Very interesting data. So what we learned, in fact, from them, as we probed further and did rigorous analysis of tens of thousands of data points and hours and hours, tens of um, hours of data, is that the spinal cord injury individuals were quite well aware that, that clinical trials were taking place in this very early time point. When they're still in the hospital bed, they have no idea what their quality of life is going to look like. And what they told us, in fact, is that an ideal time point, like many of you in the audience, would be post one year, post one year injury. Um, after they've in had a period of adjustment to understand where they are, what their quality of life is. But we know that neurophysiologically, waiting that long is not ideal. And what we learned when we take all of our data together is that there really may be a sweet spot at the four to, four to six, four to eight week window post injury. And we've shared that, oh, before I tell you how we've shared that, we also learned in a, in a parallel series of studies that individuals with spinal cord injury are really suffering from lack of adequate decision support. And we learned from them that there are three obstacles. Um, a lot has to do with the personal dimensions of risk, personal dimensions of human values, limited insight to their own recovery. But very interesting, the, I'm going to say the budding of the heads of family members in individual support networks and the physicians who treat them. And when we talked with each of these constituent groups, we learned that the doctors would say, well, it's up to the families to support these individuals with spinal cord injury. And the families would say, but it's the doctors who know the science. And what we have to do is bring these networks together in a way that actually helps the decision support for these individuals. 
And when we take all of this together, of this first example in our neuroethics journey, we've accomplished the following things and delivered the following recommendations, which is first to shift the target time points in preclinical trials. And Wolf Tetzlaff at UBC and uh, Brian Kwan are doing just that. They're now doing some trials um, with um, uh, skin-derived stem cells uh, and actually showing ef uh, efficacy in animal models at four to eight weeks out post-injury when they've been previously only been looking at the seven week out time window. We're very optimistic that these data will hold, that we may be able to start pushing out trial windows for human subjects to those later time points in response to what they've told us through our neuroethics research. We also have um, developed new partnerships, models of consent, and educational resources, both through the Stem Cell Network, which is a Canadian resource for stem cell research, the new Canadian Stem Cell Foundation, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the International Society um, of ISSCR. And here just is one model of consent, which actually um, needs to be funded now so we can test it, because we'd like to see whether peer, peer consent support as well as stage consent support might be um, more effective than the kind of consenting that we're doing for these individuals at that time. So if we can bring together better support networks, better consent, and better intervention time points, we may be able to propel stem cell science in the context of, st of spinal cord injury at least um, forward in a very, very positive way. So, where has this taken us? I, t I told you that for each of our studies, I'd show you some future directions. We are taking our stem cell research further as we look for some more funding to think about uh, the further issues in spinal cord injury. We've also started to look at stakeholder opinions around stem cells for neurodevelopmental disorders. We don't believe they are effective yet, but we do know that they are widely publicized in the press, both for autism and cerebral palsy. We know of many cases, both in the United States and Canada, of families taking their children abroad for stem cell interventions that are billed as therapeutic. Um, we've also started to look at clinical trials for neurodegenerative diseases. So if we think of spinal cord injury as um, a disorder of the central nervous system that has a trajectory and then, as and then it asymptotes, we're very interested in understanding what happens in individuals with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, for example, whose trajectory is actually that on a decline. And where are the answers to some of these questions going to lie in terms of values, interventions, and so forth? And just to show you some data, these are uh, e clinical trials of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, MS, Batten's, Battenton's disease. And if you look at the data, these are just uh, articles that have covered them in the press. Uh, even though many of these are only in safety trials, there's a huge coverage of efficacy, which is sort of inconsistent with the fact that they're really mostly, you go to clinicaltrials.gov, mostly registered at the early phases. And we're also looking at time frame projections. If you just look at how news press is covering time frames for uh, stem cells for neurodegenerative diseases, you he see here most prominently in black, where black is imminent. We're going to see an imminent cure for Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But in fact, if you look here on this side of the implementation side of the histogram, these black bars are all but absent. And we know that the actual implementation is soon at best and in the distant still at worst. So some real contrast there in terms of what the public is seeing in terms of and seeing and reading about stem cell trials for a variety of diseases, whether they're asymptotic or neurodegenerative, and what is actually going on in our laboratories at the bench and in clinical trials. So let me go on to my second example for you. And this is one that uh, Nico Schiff, who will be speaking in a few weeks here, will talk with you about. Uh, he'll tell you a lot about neuroimaging and disorders of consciousness. I'm going to tell you um, about how I think we need to think about the ethics of it and implementing it into uh, potentially uh, actionable intervention in hospitals like this one and what it means for the self. So just some basic background like we did for spinal cord injury. Traumatic brain injuries are a major cause of death and disability worldwide. We have millions of people with permanent disability today in the United States and in Canada. Today clinical diagnosis is largely relies on behavioral assessment. Reports tell us that 
they're incorrect, inaccurate as much as 40% of the time in terms of where somebody is on the spectrum of consciousness from permanently vegetative state through locked-in syndrome or minimally conscious state. And we have wonderful imaging technology to give us structural images of traumatic brain injuries, of course, <coughs> functional images, both using MRIs and using EEGs. And we have some classic studies that I'm sure you're familiar with by Stephen Lurie's in Belgium and Nico Schiff, again, he'll, he'll be hearing about, and from Adrian Owen, who's now in Canada, about how potentially certain individuals with severe brain injuries who are in minimally conscious state may be able to modulate their brain to offer responses to external stimuli. So without belaboring this too much, just to show you here on the right, this is a study by Adrian Owen, some stimuli of asking people who are behaviorally unresponsive, a very small sample, to imagine playing tennis, and imagine navigating to a person's home. And these activations here in central sulcus, somatic, supplementary motor area, and so forth, parietal cortex, are interpreted to be very similar as those of controls. And if you accept these data at face value, you would say these individuals' average data are responding, although they are behaviorally unresponsive, just like healthy controls. So, I don't know if those are signals of consciousness, and I very deliberately put a question mark there. But what I can tell you is that for people who are interested in brain and ethics, this is a, a good place for me to be, a good landscape for me to be playing in, because there are lots of questions. So what if we can have a signal of consciousness from somebody who's unresponsive? What's that person's quality of life going to be like? What's Dr. Siegler going to say, or Dr. Samasi is going to say to a family who you put into a scanner once, you have lots of scanners in the United States, maybe you can put them into scanners more often than I could in Canada where our wait times are six weeks. Cool, but so what? Right, there's a big so what question here. So we sought to map the landscape um, of the literature, develop a conceptual framework for probing questions of uh, actionability and establish some evidence for translational priorities, at least in our national healthcare system and again, I invite you to meet some of the members of my team here on the right. So the first thing we did is we um, did some bibliotheca uh, studies and we created this map from the literature of everybody who's playing in the MCS PVS space. And so it's very beautiful. I'm not sure you can see the details here, but I'll tell you what's important was that the ethics inquiry, as much as us in the audience here may be well familiar with the ethics discourse in the brain injury space, it's tiny compared to what the big guns are publishing about their results of imaging for traumatic brain injury. So we have a lot of work to do to make this little bubble of us talking about brain injury as big as the bubbles of people talking about the uh, physiologic uh, and uh, imaging interventions itself. And it's also, I've got to tell you, a small group of people who are always citing each other although there's quite a bit of that going on in our bioethics space as well. So, next thing we did, we took this literature, and if my computer doesn't freeze, I'll be able to show you a framework that we created from the literature about priorities for actionability. And we had two nodes, two major nodes. Yes, it will be actionable, and no, it won't be. And we probed experts in the field. Right, good, thank you. Whoever said that, thank you. Uh, we mapped the field. I know this will be hard to read, but I'm just going to highlight some, some basic notes for you and refer you to the article that we published in the Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences. We went to experts and we said, really, is, is this really actionable? If we get this right and we solve the ethical issues, will we be able to bring this into clinical care? And we had no, and then we queried about whether we should carry on if the answer is no or yes. And I have to tell you, for all the experts we probed, and there was more than 20, the answer was uniformly yes. But then the question was yes, but we haven't answered the so what question. So we divided our framework into seven nodes that affect people, individuals, and their, and their communities, their families, 
and institutions, and we probed for all of these nodes. And through extensive interviews and focus groups with experts in ethics, neurology, neurosurgeons, and others, we have these priorities. I'm going to show you three slides on priorities from the experts. The first one has to do with research. What do we need to do in our research laboratories to bring this technology to be clinically actionable? There are five priorities here. Correlate neuroaging with behavior. We, ha we don't have that yet. Um, we know what we think are the associations, but we don't, know real we don't have real correlative data. We don't really know the incidence and prevalence of minimally conscious states and vegetative states. Somehow we have to figure out what the probability is of um, not detecting covert consciousness in these patients, whether they're 15 or 20 percent of the entire cohort who may be a target for our audience. We absolutely, on an international plane, have to harmonize our methods, our paradigms, and our, our selection of stimuli, and harmonize our language. We are using internationally different words for the same conditions and the same words for different conditions. That's not going to advance us in our science. And we have to consider somehow some quality of life metrics, although I, I think that's going to be a, a difficult challenge. On translational priorities, you see these here. Um, we feel um, of utmost importance as specialized communication tools for every stakeholder involved in this landscape. Better practices and standards of care. What you do in Chicago should be the same as what I do in, in Vancouver with these patients, as well as harmonized technology, again, focused on covert consciousness. And on priorities for the self, if this is, technology is going to be clinically actionable, we are now going to have individuals who are going to be expressing their selfhood in however a rudimentary way, brain activation patterns, to some either diverse or harmonized kind of stimuli. What is that going to tell us about them, about who they are, about the decisions that they might be expressing to us, end of life decisions, decisions about quality life in their hospital rooms, about competence? We have to solve these issues, and it is a wide open space right now. And at the same time, I think we have to today, not tomorrow, start thinking about laws around this space. Will somebody be able to change their advanced directive through activating their brain patterns in response to Peggy Mason's stimuli in, the, in a brain scanner? Are they going to be able to say, I'm done. I, I really, I want to go. California just passed a physician-assisted suicide law yesterday. We're going to do that in Canada as well. Is a brain activation signal a signal of competence? How are we going to deal with this in the legal system um, and, and in our personal systems? And I think the implications here for self are tremendous. So our deliverables from this work, and it is still ongoing, is again, we've developed very close partnerships with advocacy in the brain injury space, as well as the disability space, um, who become very interested in the potential for bringing out the self through this kind of uh, neurotechnology. We're working uh, with Health Canada to provide evidence-based resources for the kinds of policies that Health Canada needs to be thinking about. Uh, and as well, we uh, are very interested in doing some continued research with family members themselves and potentially with recovered patients as well. So where has this research taken us? We continue there, and we've gone down some new trajectories, and we've moved some of our work from traumatic, from severe brain injuries to mild brain injuries. And this is, I'm going to say, a dirty little study that's just ongoing now. We just looked at policies around concussion, a very crowded space, both in the ethics side and in sort of the sports medicine side. And we asked the question in four countries, Canada, US, UK, and Australia, just in four major sports, what does policy guidance look like out there? And so here's a very pretty map of the, so, you, you dominate the number of policies that are out there, just so that you know. 
and Australia and Canada follow, that sort of usual fare. But I immediately think about some ethics questions there. If I'm a mom and I have an elite 17-year-old who wants to play football or soccer, and um, we're seeing some repeated concussions and head injuries, and what do I do? I go to the internet. So I want to know what's the policy du jour, right? What is uh, the NFL saying or your National Hockey League? Well, I'll tell you, you're going to find a really messy landscape. So we started to actually look at this, apply the neuroethics lens to the concussion policies that are out there, just in a tiny little post-it stamp. And um, we're looking at how policies are coordinated, what is the evidence that goes into the policies, uh, how are policies implemented and how are they adhered, and also are there sunset clauses, because the science is moving incredibly fast. And of course, a topic that's of great interest to me is the management of incidental findings. If you have a kid or an adult who is seen for a concussion or even repeated concussion, and we, did, we see in that individual an unexpected brain finding. And if we report that out, that might be, may well be the end of that individual's elite career in that sport. Uh, and so there are some, some issues around that, not only uh, in clinical medicine, but in research, of course. And here's the team that's been working with me on this project. And so I'm just going to show you, and this again is a question, clarity or confusion. On the left-hand side of this slide, you see the number of new policies that have come online for concussion for four sports in four countries. That looks like a lot of policies coming online all at once. And if, um, and if you look on the right, that's the number of existing policies today. If you go on the internet and you do some simple searches, concussion, mild head injury, sport. And in the dash line, we see those that are uh, self-described as recommended, right? We recommend that you get three days of rest and those that are mandatory. And for the same sports, for the same regions, we actually have colliding policies existing at the same time. So we think that uh, from an ethics point of view, a neuroethics point of view, um, we've, we have a gem that really requires some serious attention. It's affecting not only our adult population, it's affecting our youth. Uh, we know that repeated concussions, even the lightest concussions, uh, can lead to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, where the tau, actually, tau protein actually embeds itself in the sulci of the cortex and leads to uh, what seem to be early, uh, early onset forms of dementia. So this questions about return to, to play, who makes decisions, who's self-propelled to go back on the field, who's co coerced, and maybe we should be thinking about safe sport in addition to revised policies and our harmonization policies is uh, an important place for people interested in neuroethics to consider uh, contributing to. I'm going to go to my third example for you now. And it is a departure from the one that we have been focusing, to we've been focusing on, and it has to do with neurogenetics and dementia, predicting Alzheimer's disease in our population our now healthy population, our now not so healthy population, but our population that's aging. And what is the impact on community as this neurotechnology comes online? So what are our basic principles? We always start with those. The population is aging, we know that. We know that Alzheimer's and vascular dementia are the most prominent diseases of the aging central nervous system. There's a tremendous cost and burden on the individual and on the community. And we know that we may be able to predict, but we cannot cure. So what are the challenges of prediction? Well, one of the challenges I think has to do with the individual is that the dementias really vary so much. They vary with the biology. Where does the biology start? What's the course of the degenerative trajectory? What's our sensitivity and specificity in predicting disease? When is it going to start? Can we predict when it's going to start? Can we predict how fast somebody's going to decline? Some cases yes, some cases no. What are the implications for third parties? How are we going to manage our resources as our population ages? And fundamentally, whom to test and when? So with my colleagues, Lynn Beattie, Howard uh, Feldman, and 
Kevin Peters, we started to develop some models for looking at uh, disease uh, prediction trials and prevention trials for Alzheimer's disease, just in the healthy, I'm going to say, European-based co uh, population. And what you see here, the lights are a little bit bright, is basically in the top left of this slide is a predictive model for people who are essentially um, hold a, don't, don't have the carrier for Alzheimer's disease. And so the risk of prediction in them is quite high in terms of what benefit we can offer. And at the bottom of this slide are those who have a high genetic risk. And I'm about to share a story of a population that we've been working with you that have a high genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease, where the risk for d dementia is um, very high, but so is the benefit to risk ratio. Whereas for when there's no identifiable, identifiable genetic risk, the risk for prediction is high and the benefit low. Here it is quite the opposite. So I want to talk to you about culture and where culture and neuroethics come together. And it comes together particularly when you have a worldview of researchers like myself and Dr. Beatty here differs from the worldview of the research community. And my story here is that when I came to UBC from Stanford in 2007, um, UBC researchers had just identified the pre similin one gene in a family very, very far north uh, in British Columbia, about 2,000 kilometers north. It's actually very cold and very hard to get to, to charter a plane to get there. And they were perplexed that the people from this nation were not flocking to UBC for genetic testing. And they thought that perhaps by bringing the neuroethics lens to the question, we'd be able to bring some understanding to why there was this mismatch between neurotechnology and people living in the cold north of, of Canada. And um, I, I, my hypothesis was that um, probably nobody had bothered to bring meaning to this genetic testing to this population. And even if we were to bring meaning, to bring the resources that would make that meaning meaningful. So let's just look at this population. There's about 100 fam affected family members right now. I was just up north in August, and we're starting to see some, uh, some evidence of newly affected members. So this is, this is us guys down here. Most of us, anyway, we're not of this uh, family in the north. Uh, we're seeing late onset sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But this is this family of north, up north. They have the pre in one gene. Their onset for Alzheimer's disease is as early as 50s. There was actually a recent report of somebody with EOFAD in their 30s here in the United States. Um, and there are different PS pre genes. There's a PS12 that's also been identified. But the bottom line is if you have the gene, you're going to get early onset Alzheimer's disease. If you have a parent who has it, your chance of getting it is 50%. It's a bad disease. So is this genetic testing and bringing it up north where people are still living on reserves, where suicide is a tremendous problem, alcoholism is a tremendous problem. Is it an opportunity for this population or is it an intrusion? And, and, how, do we, and how do we address those issues? So we have been uh, traveling up north for six years in what we call the, a community-based participatory research. We used indigenous methods, and I think I'm the only one in neuroethics who has used indigenous methods to um, do neuroethics research, including sharing circles, which look a lot like focus groups, but there are some rules which I'd be happy to talk with you about if you wanted to know what they are. Uh, focus groups and individual interviews to ask the question, what do you understand about Alzheimer's disease, early onset Alzheimer's disease? Have you been talking about it? Do you know what genetics are? Has anybody talked to you about genetics? What do you want to know? if you are going to get the disease? Do you want your children to know? And all of this also happens against the backdrop of colonization and residential schools that many of the children were taken away from their families. And so there's been a tremendous fracturing of knowledge, of intergenerational knowledge in this community. So what did they tell us? In one long phase of work, every time you want to go up north, you have to charter an airplane. And it can't be when it's winter, and it can't be when the moose are running. Um, sort of some interesting challenges. Oh, we learned about the impact on the community. And what we learned is that there are still some deeply held beliefs about Alzheimer's disease, even though the families have started to understand the biomedical explanation of this disease. 
But they are not letting go of their traditional explanations. And we learned that to really provide the best medical care, health care for these individuals, we have to respect both views on this disease and how those two views interplay in the community and with each other. And this we call two eye seeing, and it comes from indigenous ways of knowing and believing. Um, we've learned that knowledge sharing is vital because of the bleak history in Canadian, um, in, our, in, our, in Canada, uh, with our indigenous people. There was a huge amount of fracturing of knowledge that passed from uh, elders to children because they were taken away from schools. So there was a lot of, of mystery around uh, the, the crazy uncle, the aunt who didn't recognize her children anymore. And kids came back into the communities now. There's been a reconciliation. And there's been a, a whole flurry of uh, both inter and intragenerational knowledge sharing that has just begun. And we, we are trying to come in with this new knowledge around Alzheimer's disease and neurotechnology to, to bring that knowledge sharing to be more robust and open. Um, we learned fundamentally that testing will remain irrelevant unless meaningfulness is demonstrated. So it may not be cure, but it has to be something more than you have the disease, your auntie had it, your mom had it, you seem to um, be manifesting some of the symptoms. We were up there, we did a focus group, and a 40-year-old gentleman said to me, the world seems to get smaller every day. And he was there with his two preteen children in a focus group with us. And um, we thought he'd come to the clinic. He still hasn't come to the clinic. And I think it's because he lives on the reserve. And he, 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 may, he, he may find out he has the gene, but um, what, he's, what he's gonna do with that information is unclear. And we're trying to provide that forward. Um, and then we also deal with the complexities of con uh, community and individual ownership, both of primary data, so what do these genetic uh, data mean, and to whom do they belong? Do they belong to the individuals and families? Do they belong to the community? Uh, do they belong to the nation and the tribe and so forth? And these, this is really a naughty problem that must be untangled. And it, it also brings up again the issue of incidental findings. Um, who, who owns those data? And I'll just share with you, for those of you interested in research ethics in this audience, for the first four and a half to five years of our project with this community, uh, we had a research agreement that did not allow us to name them in any of the work that we did. And in fact, you see this, I still haven't named them today because that's been so ingrained in me. And on the one hand, they wanted to be champions of Alzheimer's disease. And on the other hand, they were so afraid of the shame and stigma surrounding this gene and this family that we had to maintain strict confidentiality. So we were really torn as neuroethicists because we wanted to bring data from this community, with this community, to others with Alzheimer's disease, to their own community, to Health Canada, to bring skilled nursing and better resources to the community, but we couldn't name the community. So we could say up there in British Columbia. Anyway, just six months ago, we uh, ch uh, changed the research agreement to now have open, uh, openness about the nation. They're, they're the Taltan people. And uh, we are able now to go to our government with these data, with our Taltan team, and, exp and um, bring the data to them that we hope will bring resources, better skilled care, better nursing to the community. And in a departure from our normal academic deliverables, like a paper in progress in neurobiology, we are delivering resources that are meaningful to the community. On the left side, you see a cartoon book that we've published with one of, uh, with one of our uh, Taltan collaborators called The Mind Thief, all about early Alzheimer's, uh, familiar Alzheimer's disease, with, uh, that depicts the children, it's a children's book that depicts the children as Taltan children themselves. Where so many of our resources from the Alzheimer's Society um, don't look like the Taltan people, and don't really, just don't cut it for them. We've created these resources for them and by them. And on the right, and this was actually at their behest. They wanted us to create a children's book for, for them. I'm happy to send you a copy if you want it. You can also download it uh, from our, our website. We, we want to distribute it widely. And it really is meaningful not only for this community, but for other communities, indigenous communities, and those living in rural, remote areas uh, broadly in the United States and Canada. And on the right here is an, a resource book for adults, actually that we delivered, that we brought uh, up north, 
And um, I have to tell you, we were in a big SUV. We were going door to door delivering these books to the community in cabins in the wilderness. It was really an extraordinary experience. And then always gathering more collaboration, more voices. As we distribute, we'd want to learn more. And as another deliverable, again, a departure from the uh, usual academic deliverables, we also have created a little movie. It's six minutes long. Here's the link if you want to uh, view it. And for, those who, for the fellows who I'm meeting with afterwards, if you want to look at it together, I'd be happy to, uh, to bring it up. It's six minutes about early, Alzheimer, early onset Alzheimer's disease, about doing neuroethics work in rural and remote communities, and um, how incredibly meaningful that can be for all stakeholders engaged in the story. So uh, I just want to, before I, go to, before I conclude, I want to tell you that this project also has led us to new and unexpected directions, just like the stem cell work did, just like the uh, disorders of consciousness work did. We learned as part of the traditional explanations of Alzheimer's disease the, that the belief that the changing landscape uh, is actually affecting brain and mental health of the communities that live in close proximity to the oil sands, for example, to the pipelines, for example. And here's a beautiful quote. I'm part of any environment, and if my environment suffers, I suffer as well. So we started to go down this path, and we said, hmm, what's going on in the area of brain and mental health as it applies to new kinds of resourcing from the environment? And in a way that I like to create new things, I've called this environmental neuroethics. And we have actually been starting to look at the effects of technological change, the benefits of it, industry, economic expansion, even uh, population growth and health, to the actual questions about how is all this changing brain and mental health, particularly in people who live close to oil sands and pipelines. Here's the team on the right. And so we've embarked on a little study, it's just hot off the press, on fracking. Fracking affects us in British Columbia, it affects Canadians in Alberta, it's going to affect you because we're going to be sending you oil from up north down here, I think, to Texas when eventually the pipeline goes through. So what's in the literature about brain and mental health and fracking, just as one example? And we found that there are about 100 papers that deal with fracking. If you do a rigorous search, there are all ways I'm not going to explain to you now, but you will trust me to know that our methods are rigorous. Found about 100 papers. Most of them talk about asthma, so respiratory disease, skin diseases. Almost none talk about brain and mental health. And if you think about it, we know that there are neurotoxins in the environment that change brain and mental health. And we know that the chemicals that are going into fracking, some which remain a proprietary, but some that are open, are neurotoxic. So how is it possible? that no one's talking about brain and mental health in this unconventional gas development literature. And so this is just a, a one, one of the many graphs we have of our data where brain and mental health is sort of loosely mentioned in a journal article. You see the graph on the left, and you see the example of it on the right. And then almost none of them, around 20 of them, make some brief mention around brain and mental health. And actually, there are only two papers, one of which is my own, that substantially brings the ethics discussion about brain and mental health into this changing environment space. And again, for those of you interested in neuroethics, this is another place where we can all make a huge contribution forward. Here are just some other uh, ethics uh, concerns that we found in the literature. As you see, the fracking literature, as you might expect, uh, basically says that fracking and other kinds of unconventional gas development are safe and uh, have no harmful effects on the environment or on people. That's the majority here. And a little bit of ethics concerns uh, we found mostly had to do with trust, vulnerable populations, justice and disempowerment. That's really a mental health issue. And a little bit around the precautionary principle. Maybe we should be thinking about the implications of what we're doing to the environment as it affects individuals and society. So this is a paper that we were very lucky to be able to publish in the Journal of Lyme Biosciences and uh, uh, as part of a recommendation that we met, uh, made to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. And we were very grateful, Dr. Samansi, that the commission accepted it. And uh, 
really enabled us to go forward. So I'd like to summarize for you now. We've talked about neuroethics in the context of neuroscience discovery, neurotechnology, and human values. I've highlighted three principles. There are only three. There are many, many more. Autonomy, self, and community. And I've done my best to give you some examples in neuroethics where we started with what's going on now, where ought we be going, where ought we go, and what lies ahead. And I hope that I've showed you some concrete examples of the kind of impact that we can make in a domain where sometimes people think oh, we don't really have an impact. But in our very pragmatic, solution-oriented way, uh, we really are uh, making positive change. These are just some of the historical milestones in uh, neuroscience and ethics, starting all the way back here to uh, Walter Freeman's prefrontal lobotomies, some of the changes we know that occurred uh, after the Nuremberg trials where neurologists and psychiatrists were really the most egregious in perpetrating crimes against humanity. And all the way through to 2010, we've come a long way, a long way in ethics and neuroscience. And today we have the International Neuroethics Society. We have the Pre Presidential Commission on the Study of Bioethical Issues that's devoted so much of its attention to ethical issues in neuroscience and neuroethics. We're very grateful for that, and we have a long way to go. And so this is my summary slide. Where do we go from here? I think we continue deeply to integrate human values into all aspects of neurotechnological advancement and neuroscience discovery. Drawing on my theme of how important voices are, put the voices of all stakeholders in there. And I would say, as a, one of the pioneers of the field, leave no stun, stone unturned as new opportunities arise for us in our scholarship and our science. Thank you very much. So, one of the things I, I am um, confused by is, to put it bluntly, why we should care what the opinion is of when to put in a therapy. Why does it matter wh when the person thinks if there is a that does not make a physiological truth. That may, that may make a legal fact, but it does not make a physiological truth. Why don't we care simply what's the correct scientific timing? End of story. Yeah. So I love that question, and I thank you for it. Um, I would argue that we've been doing science without the human for a very, very long time. And now we're at a place where we have neurotechnologies and clinical trials that aren't being well populated, that aren't being taken up. And so the question is, why aren't they being taken up? So one example I gave you was from genetic testing in a population for whom it's virtually or was virtually meaningless. In the spinal cord population and stem cells, we put a lot of science into it, but there's not a lot of uptake yet. There isn't um, a lot of clinical trials yet. But if we take the values and we put it together with the science, don't we create a more perfect storm than just one or the other? So if we can actually, uh, and, and, okay, and, and won't we actually have better outcomes? So if we, we have a patient with a spinal cord injury, totally traumatized, with an early intervention, they have no idea what their life is going to look like, they're confused, they have trauma, they probably still have some edema, everybody's running around, and we enroll them in a clinical trial. How, how well would their personal disposition lend to their recovery or the, or the effectiveness of that trial? And I think what we're arguing is that if we could just take that window out a little bit without jeopardizing the science, let the, the acute period pass, let everybody settle down, we think the intervention might actually benefit from, I'm going to say the better participation, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, from the individual. You, you can argue 
well, let's test it. And I'm going to say, I'm on board with you. Let's test it. But that's the evidence. And then you know, you, you, we, we work with individuals, and they say, you know, it's true. When I was uh, on the trauma unit, Dr. Siegler could have asked me to participate in anything, and I would have said yes. But I really had no idea what I was consenting to, nor, nor did my love person, my, my, my parent. And if we could just have moved that out, I could have actually made a, a better decision for myself and my family. And if you put all those things together, if the science works outside that window, right? And that's, that's my caveat. We have to show that science works out that, outside that tiny little window. I, I think we can have more powerful outcomes. That's the goal. But if we showed that the science is most effective in the first 24 to 48 hours, then it would modify your, your position. So, <laughs> so no, no. People have asked that question. So, so th this is you know this is like giving a, a, you know IV anti antibiotics when somebody's you know acutely septic, right? You, you of course, right? But we don't have stem cells that are have that kind of efficacy right now. No, I, I, right. I, I didn't mean to. Right. Okay, but but a cochlear implant and a clinical stem cell trial is a little bit a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. What the the problem here is that you're you're mixing um, clinical therapy with clinical right. trials. Right. Those are two very different. We're talking about experimental medicine here. Right. In order to do, you, we're not promising these people, you know, any sort of benefit. Right. We're asking them to be guinea pigs, and so of course you need to talk to them about when they would like to become guinea pigs. Right. We're not talking about therapeutic. Um, any sort of efficacy for them. So my question is about how do you sure, how do you deal with the larger issues like, for example, the Alzheimer's Foundation, whose basic goal is to diagnose everybody in the country with Alzheimer's disease. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with that kind of, of, of group um, when you're do, trying to do sort of ethical, neuroethical research? Hmm. So I have to unpack how do you deal with and what you're, what you're after. So we, um, we deal with the Alzheimer's Association in a number of ways. We go to them for funding. That's big. We try to distribute or, or disseminate materials that they provide that we think uh, are, are helpful uh, to the extent that we're with patients who might benefit from them. So there's no filtering there. Um, and we try, and we do, bring our resources to the Alzheimer's Foundation and Alzheimer's Society. So these books that we've published, for example, on early onset Alzheimer's disease, we will be giving to the Alzheimer's Foundation for downloading, distributing. We've, we're putting them in the clinics across Canada. It, for us, though, those, those, are, those are solutions. Um, if the Alzheimer's Society is willing to distribute material that we've produced, we, we are grateful for that. Yeah. There are, you know, I'm just thinking there are, there are a couple of kids' books out there that the Alzheimer's Society has, has produced. They're, they're quite different from what we produce, though. They're, they're, they're very basic. They don't have an emotional component, and they don't have a, a holistic component, because we as European people don't really think that way. And um, we're hoping that the kind of work that we're doing with, with Alzheimer's disease will will shift everybody's thinking and, and bring the envelope of understanding to be a little bit that much bigger. Um, some people might say, well, what do I care about indigenous people in Chicago, who, indigenous people who live in Canada? But you know what? I learned a lot from working with them about my values, my values around aging, disease, quality of life, brain health. So I think we can all benefit. I really enjoyed your talk. I'm a pediatric ICU doctor, so I'm seeing at least the spinal cord injuries in the acute period. I get the four to six weeks, but I also get that there are families and there are teenagers that are begging for something in yeah. the ICU. Um, and uh, so I wonder if moving, and I personally, I mean, from what I've read of the literature, I think earlier makes more sense clinically to me. 
But the other thing I'm seeing is that our last five high spinal cord injuries were gunshot wounds. Were gunshot, gunshot were gunshots. wounds? Gunshots. Mm -hmm. um, and fundamentally, they have a very different socioeconomic background right. yeah. than the person that falls off a horse. Right. And, and that's the other piece. They're not getting the same recovery. It's just, it, we've, we've also got the data here that cochlear implants, depends on how many words your parents are talking to you every day. They're not getting the same outcomes. And so when we're doing the research, how are we going to, to adjust with these very different groups of people? Yeah, so it, it's a wonderful question, thank you. So I, I think we come back to the distinctions between therapy and clinical trials, right? That's number one, and we have to, we have to respect those distinctions. Of course, if we could show that in two days you can inject some stem cells straight into the spinal cord and either you know, prevent the, pr the progression of, um, of, of the disease, right? Even, even there, of, of course. But we're talking about experimental trials now. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, we, we sometimes say that it's people who are of the lowest socioeconomic status who are the guinea pigs for the most experimental trials. But actually, I've had somebody, um, Scott Atlas, actually, who was the chief of neuroradiology at Stanford, argue with me that it's actually the wealthiest who are the, who are the guinea pigs, because they're, they're knocking on the door the first time something comes out. So I, I think, sorry? It might be bimodal. It might be bimodal, right? So just what I was gonna say, it might be, it might be bimodal. Um, you know, for me, it's all about the science, and, and I include ethics in, as under that science envelope. If the evidence suggests through our clinical trials that and through rigorous clinical trials, right, approved all the way through, that outcome is better if, if you wait. We might have to do that. But we're, we're a long way from doing that. But I think what's, what, uh, at least from a, uh, uh, an experimental point of view, I, I was very gratified to, to work with scientists who were willing to say, this ethics result is really important. You know, we're all hypothesizing acute and subacute time points and um, knocking off these rats two days you know, after we, we injure them. Nobody thought to maybe just wait a little bit and see if we can have as good efficacy from the scientific point of view as from, I'm gonna say, the human value, the human values point of view. The proof is in the pudding, um, but there's, there's, a, there's a dimensionality there that I, that I think it's important to consider.